So my, my background uh, is a Pentecostal Protestant background. And at the age of 17, I became born again. Um, and as a young man, I was looking for a church uh, to really live out my purpose in God. Around about the age of 21, I found this church um, that I heard a lot about that were doing things in the community. And I went there to go and, and see what it was about. And, and it was a really big church. Um, and to me, it sounded like they were preaching the word. Nothing sounded uh, out of the ordinary. Um, and I decided uh, to join. Um, and, and there were many terms and things that I heard that I hadn't heard before, like faith seed, um, your best gift, uh, life and death is in the power of the tongue, so I only speak positive. So this was all new to me, but because it was always related back to Scripture, I thought that they were following the Word of God. After about five years, um, I really felt spiritually drained. It felt like I was only getting milk and, and not meat. The messages always revolved around giving or receiving some kind of blessing. Even the special uh, speakers that they brought in were always only speaking about this giving um, and this receiving. So I started looking uh, for a, a new church. Um, and then not long afterwards, a friend of mine gave me a DVD to watch. Um, it was called The Secret and I didn't know anything about it. And I put it on and I watched it. And I immediately realized it is New Age teachings. Um, but what really struck me and, and flabbergasted me is that a lot of the terms that I heard them use in the secret, a lot of the techniques, were very similar to what I had heard in the Word of Faith movement. And obviously I then started delving a little bit deeper into that. And also I went back and started looking again at the specific scriptures that they were using to promote this doctrine. And I found all kinds of issues with the interpretation of those scriptures. So, with regards, you mentioned the secret. What are some of the parallels? If you could just give us a few examples of, of the parallels between mm. the secret and some of the word of faith movement practices. So, in, in the secret, what they do is they, they concentrate on something which is called the law of attraction. And they believe by using positive thought and positive words and positive actions, they can get the universe to respond in a positive way and give them all their dreams and desires. The word of faith is very much the same. It is to use your words in order to change your reality and changing that reality into getting a blessing from God. What I also noticed is that a lot of the terms used were very similar. Um, the secret will speak about the universe in the place of God. Um, they will speak about the law of attraction, where the word of faith movement will speak about the law of faith. But all of it is really based on having positive thoughts, using positive words in order to create this blessed reality that you want in this life. Interesting. Someone may say, well, what is wrong with that? Um, my circumstances are unfortunate. I'm, I'm poor. Why would then God have a problem with me wanting to change my circumstances by positive confession or any other practice that just improves my life? What do you say to someone with that sort of mindset? For us as Christians, what is key is to keep the simplicity of Jesus Christ. And that is really the testimony, the word, the word that became flesh. When we look at the use of, for instance, word of faith, that comes from Romans 10. But if you look at the context of that passage, the word of faith is the word that became flesh. It is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is not using your words to speak things into a reality, to positively confess. But it is going out and declaring the word of faith that Jesus Christ has brought salvation 
to everyone who will believe. So it's critical for us to stay as close as possible to Scripture. I understand that when someone is going through a really difficult time, they might want to look at some kind of formula to change their circumstances. But it's not scriptural. James 1 says to us that we must rejoice when we face all kinds of trials because it builds steadfastness in us. And if we allow that steadfastness to play out, it brings a perfection within us. It makes us whole. And that is what God wants for us. He wants us to absolutely trust Him no matter the circumstances. And it brings me back to what Paul said. He said that, you know, I've had a lot and I've had little, but in all things I am content. And that is the basis of our faith. It is about Jesus Christ. And if God blesses us, glory be to Him. But if we are going through a difficult time, glory be to Him. In all things we praise His name. So then, again, Anton, one of the dynamics of the Word of Faith movement is this idea of always walking in victory. I mean, if you could just break that down for us and what it actually means. Well, first of all, I'm going to, to look at it practically. Because we do live in a fallen world. And Jesus said, in this life you will have tribulation. Now, I am going to ask you a question and say, do you, in your Christian walk, only walk in victory and only have blessing? No. Yet you are a believer. So what we need to do is, is we need to get back to the Word of God and what the Word is saying. Because Jesus did say we can ask Him anything and He will do it to bring glory and honor to the Father. But James says that we don't get because we ask to satisfy our own passions. John says that if we ask according to the will of God, He will do it for us. But even in our own lives, when your child asks you for something, you don't give them everything that they ask. They might not understand why, but you don't give them everything. And we were not promised that we will always walk in victory and never have tribulation and never have problems. It is clear if we look at the lives of the disciples. They suffered. They went hungry. Sometimes they didn't have clothes. They were shipwrecked. And at the end, each one of them were murdered, except John. Yet that is a great testimony to God that even to the end they kept their faith in God, even with the loss of their lives. And that is really what our faith is about. That is how we walk in victory, in victory that we've overcome this world because we've got Christ in us. It is not walking in a victory where you always have money, you always have health, and you never have a problem. Now I'm going to give you a couple of examples in my own life, my own testimony. And then I'm going to give you two other examples. With the financial crash in 2008, by 2009 my business had gone bankrupt and I'd lost everything. And when I say everything, I lost everything. And it took years for me to kind of come out of that. And just as I started coming out of it, I got a call from my mother and she said to me, my sister had passed away. And what made it really bad is that my sister was murdered. And seven months after my sister passed away, I was in a major car accident. Nine out of ten times a person would have died in that car accident, but I survived. So now you might ask, how can that bring glory to God? And I'll tell you how. God has restored everything that I lost with my business, my home, everything. He's restored it back to me. Double to what I had. Scripture says that we don't mourn like the world. 
I know I will get my sister back. God spared my life in that car accident. But the greatest blessing that I received from that is that I had massive opportunities to stand up in church and tell people, look at what the Lord has done. Look at the marvelous works of God. I didn't speak anything into existence. I just kept my faith in Jesus Christ. And I said, Lord, even if my circumstances never changes, as long as I have you, I've got eternal life. And that is all that matters. But God gave me the opportunity to go and stand in front of believers and unbelievers and speak the truth of Jesus Christ. When we had my sister's funeral, I spoke to hundreds of people. And in that terrible circumstances, I could glorify God. And everyone that walked out there knew how wonderful and how great the God of Israel is. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And that is what it is about. It is about bringing glory to God in all circumstances. If you have a lot or if you have a little, glorify Him. It's not about us. Oh, well, Anton, that is an incredible uh, testimony. Just a testament to, to keeping that purity of, of our faith in Jesus Christ. One of the other things I wanted to speak to you about was the practices and the methodology you know, as, as obviously encouraged by the preoccupation with the good life. If you could just give me some examples of methodology and, and what people are encouraged to. You spoke about sowing a seed earlier on. You know, if you could just give me maybe some practical example of some of the things that you saw happen or some of the things that you yourself may have been involved in, you know, while a part of this movement. So the sowing of the seed or giving your best gift is, is something that they obviously focus on quite a lot. But when we go back to scripture um, and we look at what a scripture say is the sowing of the seed, we see it's not about giving of money. And for them, that terminology that they use is about giving. And they say, if you give money to the church, then God will bless you 30, 60, or even a hundredfold, according to what you gave. Now, the, the, the parable of the sower that Jesus told has got nothing to do with giving money. What it is, it's about the word of God that goes out, that is being sowed in the world. Some will hear it, but when tribulation comes, they fall away. And for some, it will fall in good ground. And then it will multiply 30, 60 or 100 fold. But that increase is about souls. It is about taking the word out into the world and getting that harvest of souls and not about giving money in order to receive a blessing. You know, it's, a, it's amazing the preoccupation with money in this movement as opposed to souls as you've just mentioned and I think that is the tragedy the tragedy is you know seemingly God's preoccupation with my financial success no concern for my character just my financial success and my comfort you know. it is a very nice message because we all want to hear that, you know, we can live a life where everything only goes well. And we achieving our dreams and whatever we want from God, we can just ask. The reality is from scripture, it is different. Jesus said, count the cost. There is a cost to our faith and walking in faith with Jesus Christ. It is not that God is not interested in our daily lives. He even knows when a little bird falls on the ground. But God is more interested in our walk with Him, our daily walk with Him, in trusting Him no matter what the circumstances might be. 
So for me, it's, it's really simple. Yes, they have an unnatural focus on prosperity, on having a life where you seemingly have no issues and no problems. That is not what Scripture promises. That is not what Jesus promised. He actually promised that there will be tribulation, but because we have Him, He will hold us in the palm of His hand and we will overcome this world. Jesus in um, the book of John, um, John 16 verses 33, says the following. He says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, with that, Anton, one of the things you mentioned, you mentioned having gone through a time where you lost everything and then the Lord restored. Can you just delve deeper into that so that you, you help some of the people that are involved in this movement and that are looking for that quick fix, that, that wanting to just get back on top or just wanting to get out of situation? What sort of advice would you give to those people? It is a daily walk with God. You know, you're going to have days where you walk in victory and you're going to have days where you walk in defeat. But you hold on to Jesus Christ and you persevere. I um, had to go through a real uh, difficult time processing everything that had happened, accepting what had happened, and then trusting God and saying, even if this is my future, I still trust in you. I still believe in you and I still hold on to you. And then every day to just walk with God and hold on to him. There was no special formula that I implemented. There was no positive confession that I implemented. But it was just my pure faith in Jesus Christ and in walking with him. But a key as well is we cannot just walk with God. We also have to do. So every day I did. And if it worked, it worked. And if it did not work out, the next day I would work again and try again. And in time, things started to happen. And every time something great happened, and there were many things along this path to get back to where I am, I would go and give honor and glory to God. Because one uh, parable that always stuck in my mind from Scripture was when Jesus healed the lepers and only one came back to thank him. The other nine lost their healing. And I always said, with whatever God is doing to, for me, and I want to be genuine, I just don't want to just tell people everything is great and God is good, but everything had really meant something to me. I went to the church and to other people and, say, and said, look at what the Lord has done. So really simply is, it's getting up every day, walking in your faith, and just keeping your hand busy. Keep putting one foot in front of the other foot and just trusting God. And then He works out the way that you should go. You know, Proverbs 6, 16 verse uh, 3 says that a man thinks out his way, but it is God that directs his steps. And that is what I believe. Thank you, Anton. That, that really is, is quite encouraging, I believe, for a lot of people. You know, it is, it is just living it out, living out your faith, you know, taking it a day at a time and trusting the Lord on a daily. One of the other things that then becomes a challenge is you obviously go through this time where, where you're being tried or you're being challenged or whatever term you may attest to it. There are people right now that are going through similar experiences. And um, a, lot of, a lot of the words I hear when people go through a time that's challenging, there is generally this belief that, well, I'm, I'm going through this because of what I've done. How did you deal with that? How did you deal with maybe, maybe having to look at your situation and think, I could have, how did you deal with that, that aspect of your life? 
I will give you two examples. Um, firstly, regarding myself. It was a question, and especially because I had come out of that word of faith methodology that kind of said that you must have done something wrong or you don't have enough faith. So although I had moved away from it, those teachings still kind of affected my thought process. And I had to really delve into scripture and realize just as I haven't done anything to deserve my salvation, in the same way there's nothing that I'm doing that God is now somehow punishing me. Yes, many times we do make mistakes in our lives with things we do and we will carry the consequences. There, there's no doubt about that. But it wasn't God standing on the one side hitting me over the head because I was not the kind of child that he wanted or I didn't have enough faith. So I really had to process that and get through it. And, and I realized it's, it's not my works. It is the work of God. And I trusted in him to change my circumstances, but I realized it would be God that would do the work. I just had to keep doing what I needed to do every day. And then I'm going to tell you um, about a gentleman called Horatio Spafford. In 1871, um, there was the Great Chicago Fire. And he was a very wealthy lawyer, he was a believer, but his two-year-old son died in the fire. And he basically lost all his possessions. He had then put his wife and his four daughters on a ship to send them uh, off to, to England while he settled some of his business affairs. And the family going on their way to England the ship they were on sank and his four daughters drowned. Only his wife survived. He then decided to meet his wife in England and he got on a ship and when he got to the area where his four daughters had drowned, he sat down and he wrote a song. And that song is, it is well, it is well with my soul. The Presbyterian Church at that time said it was God's divine judgment on him. Yet how many could have imagined that with the loss of five children, you would write a song to the honor and glory of God that would be sung for over a hundred years by millions and millions of believers to glorify God who is in heaven. So we do not always understand the circumstances and the things that happen in our lives that are sometimes devastating. But if we allow God to take those circumstances and turn it around where there's a song that comes out from inside us that glorifies the Lord, that is everlasting and that is what it is about. The everlasting glory of God. Wow. Zinclair, the, the, the contradiction um, that many of these leaders uh, of these, these churches hold to it is, is quite astounding. Mm. You know, they, they speak about speaking your healing, speaking your prosperity. But I've seen some of these leaders when they get cancer, they go for treatment. I've seen some of them that have back problems, they go for back operations. And if you look at the cover of that book you're holding, that man has got glasses on his face. Now, why can he not just speak to his eyesight so that he does not have to wear glasses? It's not a major miracle like raising the dead. But you see the contradiction of what they teach and what they walk out in their lives. It astounds you when you look at it, that what they say is not what they do. 
So then what you're basically saying, then it speaks to their own moral compass and their sense of right and wrong and ethics, the deceit, the, the wanting to create an impression and almost like having two sets of standards for the laity and for themselves. Yeah, so what, what, through what they are teaching, they are obviously becoming very wealthy. And they see it as the blessing of God. You know, I always say when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. So they see it as a great blessing from God. But when you look at the fruit of their lives, for instance, with something like wearing glasses, why do their own principles they not work in their own lives. If that is what they are teaching believers, that if you just employ these techniques and these principles, you can have your healing, you can be financially prosperous, you can have all these things if you just employ it. Yet in their own lives you can see that those principles and those techniques and those formulas they claim to work does not work. It reminds me of... Uh I was watching TV one of one of the Christian one of the big Christian networks, and I had um, one of the, I suppose one of the most popular preachers say that uh, he needed a private jet so he can deliver food to to poor people in Africa. <laughs> I I always say say to people that, um, and I use Paul as a as an example. Paul didn't ride on the finest Arabian horses all over Asia to go and preach the gospel. He was shipwrecked. He <clears throat> was in danger of robbers and thieves. He went hungry. And at the end, he paid with his life for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So again, scripturally, we are not promised that we are going to have this wonderful blessed life and that we are going to be able to live a life of luxury in order to preach the gospel. The gospel will cost you something and it might cost you to give up everything that you hold as dear. It might be lands, it might be a business, it might be a job and God calls you to go and do ministry work in a small village in Africa but it will cost you something but it is not the other way around it is not that God's going to take you from a level of poverty and then make you fabulously rich because now you are you are Christian and you can claim and proclaim all these things and and it's a big concern to me because we know in the world that people are really battling financially. People are struggling to make it day to day. Believers are struggling to make it day to day. And then someone comes with this message that says, if you do this, if you give this money, then God is almost obligated to bless you. And that's very dangerous and it gives them false hope. And I've seen the unfortunate thing where believers become offended in God because what they thought was doing what the Word is saying was not working. And then they say, God, but I am giving so much money. I'm sowing the seed. I'm speaking the words. I'm doing all these things that I'm supposed to do, but nothing is happening. And they become offended in God. And I've even seen some fall away from the faith. Because they say that the word does not work. But that is not the word, as we've discussed. The word in its simplicity is about Jesus Christ. That salvation is through grace and through faith in Jesus. That is what it is about. True, true. Earlier on you mentioned that, you know, in, our, in the earlier part of our interview, you mentioned that even the outside speakers that would be brought in, they would seem to have come in on cue to continue with that. I think one of the concerns is obviously, you know, now you've just spoken about how people eventually get disillusioned and fall away from God. 
I want us to go into how this sort of gospel then doesn't speak to your life becoming Christ-like and, and your character and, and you having the attributes that a Christian ought to have and then just creates the sense of, well, I'm entitled to the good life. I don't really have to do any work on my character. Can you just maybe speak more into that? The, the message that comes out of Word of Faith or the, the prosperity gospel, as I say, it, it, it sounds good on the ears. And it sounds like to be a Christian is, is this easy, wonderful thing. Um, I had heard of a gentleman who said that he became a Christian because God's going to make him fabulously rich. Um, so for me, that is a false conversion. Um, because when you are born again of the Spirit, you understand that wealth and riches mean nothing. Everlasting life means everything. Um, and what we do for God in this life is the only thing that will count in the next life. So the prosperity gospel and word of faith very subtly take the focus of God and brings it towards man. So although they, they, they speak in, in big swelling words of God, what I have found is, is that it's always brought back to you. It's always about you. It, it is about this wonderful life that you can have now, and you almost become the center, the focus, and it's like God is standing ready to be at your beg and call. And that is not scriptural. God is not our genie in the bottle that we can just call upon to give us whatever we desire. It's not about us. It's not about our success. It's not about our health and, and the things in our lives. It's about Jesus Christ and the glory of God through sending His Son to us. And that is what God wants us to live out in our own lives. That is what I truly believe. Yeah, so our salvation becomes almost, and the righteousness that's required becomes just an afterthought. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is you and your happiness and your health and your progress. All the things that the Bible says in eternity won't count for anything. Mm -hmm. you know, I trust that that and I think it's important for us to emphasize that we are not anti-wealth or anti-people doing well. But what we are trying to address is, you know, the excesses that are encouraged, you know, by this movement and what it then produces in people. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very good point. Is, is, um, I'm not saying that God does not bless believers. I'm not saying that... that God does not heal infirmities. What I'm saying is, is that if that becomes the focus of your life, if that becomes the focus of your gospel message, that you are going to somehow live this wonderfully prosperous life, and that is what it is about, that is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. Like I said to you, if God blesses us, praise His name, but if we go through a very difficult time, praise His name, it does not matter about the circumstances. We've got one message, salvation in Jesus Christ. So yes, we're not against money or, or the blessing of people. However, it is where's the focus? Where, what, what is God to you? Because it's very easy for your focus to shift from worshipping God and subtly it changes and you become so focused on money and wealth and prosperity and things going good that that becomes a God to you. That is what you think about. That is what you focus on. That is all that, that you are interested in and that is not from God. And to that, the scriptures say you cannot love God and money. Mm. You will love one and hate the other. Yeah. And hence the, the low standards uh, I believe in, 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 in the morality in some of these churches because the focus is not even pleasing God 
the focus is rather me so uh, god is just someone that i give money to and give nothing else i do not give him my life i do not give god my heart i do not give him my dreams and my ambitions and i do not let him run the processes in my life that need to be run so um, this is indeed a problematic doctrine you know it is